good Thursday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Our text today comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, where the Bible says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Up till now, Peter has been describing the tremendous, marvelous salvation that believers enjoy and how that reality exists in spite of the tribulations that we endure, that we can set our hope on our salvation, on the return of Jesus, and that will fix and ground our faith as we face various types of trials. Remember, suffering is the theme of 1 Peter, suffering in the sense of brotherhood we have as a, as a Christian community. And here he specifically gets into the nuts and bolts of what that looks like, of how we live in light of the salvation we have received. Back in verse 3, he says, we have been born again to a living hope. And he's going to come back to the language of being born again later in this chapter. And it would make sense then, since we have been born again, that we are to grow up as obedient children. He's going to, again, pick up this analogy in chapter 2 as he talks about being an infant. So you're born again, and now as a child growing and maturing, there are certain qualities and characteristics you need to possess. And that's what he's going to talk about. So chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, introduces three commands. And what, by command, I specifically am referring to words that are in the imperative mood in Greek. You might read it in English and think, well, I'm counting more than just three commands. But there are three commands in, in the Greek uh, specifically, and there are a lot of conjoining phrases that help fill in the blanks and, and, and kind of color the page a little bit to explain what those commands mean. Those three commands are this. He first says, set your hope. That's imperative in the Greek. That's a command. He second says, be holy, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. You might think, well, doesn't he also say be conformed? Well, this is a participle in Greek. It's not an, a verb in the imperative. Uh, so be holy is the second command. And the third command is that we conduct ourselves with fear. So three commands, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. The second command is be holy in all your conduct. And the third command is conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. What do we make of these three commands and of the various phrases that attach to them? First of all, he says, set your hope. And before you can set your hope, there's something you need to do. You need to prepare your minds for action and be sober minded. And really, there are just two different ways of describing the same thing. The, the King James here says, gird up your loins or gird up the loins of your mind. This is referring to... Uh, when men would dress in this time, they would have longer flowing garments. And if they needed to get busy working or potentially engage in combat, they would cinch up that garment, gird up your loins so that they could engage in that physical activity. And the ESV here says, prepare your minds for action. That's their way of kind of paraphrasing that phrase, since we don't wear garments like that today. Cinch up your belt, pull up your britches, tuck in your shirt, get ready for business, is, is how we might say it in our current vernacular. Be ready. Prepare your minds for action. Don't be intellectually lazy. Engage your brain. Get it ready. And this is going to take all kinds of form throughout our Christian walk. That might mean we need to spend more time in prayer or reflection on God's word or study or contemplation about God and what he has accomplished through Jesus. We need to prepare our minds for action. We're not going to sit back and be armchair quarterbacks. We are going to be on the field. We are going to be working for the cause of Christ. So prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. Far too many Christians, particularly Christian men, have difficulty being serious about the work of the Lord. 
very often it's all a joke, it's all humorous, and sometimes we don't take a moment to step back and say, we are engaged in the serious business of Christ. And so Peter says, before you can set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you first, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. Get your mind right. And when your mind is right, he says, set your hope fully, not partially. It's not that we hope for something uh, good in this life half the time and the other half the time we're, we're hoping on the return of Christ. He says, our minds, our hope must fully be set on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus and as we pointed out in prior videos, he has constantly referred to the revelation, the return of Jesus in this text. Verse 14, as obedient children, so growing up, we've been born again, verse 3 says, and now we're growing as obedient children. He says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but he gives us the second command, be holy. So first command is set your hope on, on the, the grace to be revealed. The second man, command is be holy. If the first command has to do with our minds and how we think, the second command has to do with our conduct and how we live. He starts by saying, before you are holy, you first cannot be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So the second command, be holy, and in order to do that, you have to not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Some of these words are very colorful to me, passions of our former ignorance ignorance. It's not just to say that you know, we, we, were, we were pretty immature before, but we were ignorant. We had no knowledge of the truth of God and of his ways and of Christ and of, of the promise of salvation. These things were foreign to us. We were totally ignorant and we conducted ourselves in sensuality, in passions. We just, whatever felt good, we did. And that's what we did before. And he says, as obedient children of the Father, you can't be that way. You've got to put to death these passions. And as God, who has called us as holy, we should be holy. Children like to imitate their parents. That's what a good child does. A good child and a good parent has a relationship where the child wants to grow and mature and be like mom or be like dad. And here, our Father is holy, and we long to also be holy. So that's the second command. You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, so we still have this kind of child-father relationship in mind, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, we get here the third command. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. We've talked about this word quite a bit. We are outsiders living in a world that rejects us, even though we know that we are to inherit the earth as Jesus has himself told us. We are to conduct ourselves with fear, with reverence. To me, you can draw a straight line between conducting yourself with fear and this attitude of being sober-minded, being serious about it. It's not all fun and games. Yeah, we can laugh and have a good time, but what we're talking about here is something critically important. So we conduct ourselves with fear. So those are the three commands. Number one, again, set your hope. Number two, be holy. Number three, conduct yourselves with fear. And as we do this, we know the truth of our salvation. He's going to connect all of this back to the prior salvation that he's already explained in, in this chapter. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways, these are the same feudal ways that we could describe as our former passions. Knowing that we've been ransomed from these feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. The salvation he has already talked about with such beauty in this chapter, he, he brings it back to that. And have you noticed that about this letter? And we're going to see this as we go. Peter constantly brings back whatever he's talking about to the salvation we've received in Jesus. Every area of the Christian walk is informed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's not as if we think back to the past and say, oh, that was a nice thing that Jesus did for us. He bore our sins on the cross and was, and was raised from the dead, and that's all good, and that's all in the past, and now we just got to try to do our best. That's not how Peter sees the world. Every area of the Christian walk connects in some way back to the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every breath we draw is filled with the awareness and knowledge that Jesus died for us on the one hand, but also on the other hand, with the hope of his 
revelation of his return, of the salvation to be revealed at the last time, he says. So Peter is constantly connecting us between those two events, those two foundational events, the first and second comings of Jesus. So he says, knowing all the while that you were ransomed from this by the precious blood of Christ, this Christ who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. And again, this connects us to a reality we're seeing in 1 Peter chapter 1, that the church is not an afterthought, but the church was the end game. The, re this, the death and resurrection of Jesus and the church he established was the end game for God's plan. All of this, he was made foreknown before the foundation. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, made manifest for our sake, who through him are believers in God. And of course, again, he connects it to the uh, to the death and then the resurrection of Jesus, so that our faith and hope are in God. I hope we learn as we look at First Peter and the rest of the New Testament as well, that the New Testament is not just a moral code of do's and don'ts. The New Testament is the application of the death and resurrection of Jesus to our daily life. That's what it is. It's not as if there was the law of Moses and that was taken away and now we have a new subset of that law, which is how we live. No, all of our behavior has been re-envisioned, recontextualized, re-imagined around the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as, as Christians, as we consider how do we live in this world, we are constantly coming back to how did Christ live? How did Christ suffer? What does his resurrection mean for me and for how I live day to day? Every area of our life connects back to the cross and to the empty tomb. Thanks for joining us today on Begin in the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you'll live out today in the Word of God. Thanks for joining us today on Begin in the Word. If this video has been a blessing for you, we invite you to like, comment, or subscribe.